For years, I have bought and returned a lot of Galaxy S devices, um, not so much to do with the, pro the product that Samsung produces or manufactures, but it has more to do with my biases that I have already. I am a longtime iOS user uh, since the very first iPhone, the iPhone 2G. Um, with the Samsung devices, they have gotten more and more attractive, more and more premium over the years, but there's a few things, a few hangups that I have uh, that prevented me from really giving it a try. One of my biggest biases was against the Samsung One UI, um, and that's really what kept me from going. Last year, I tested a Pixel Fold for about three months, and I really enjoyed that experience, but ultimately, I went back to my iOS device, my iPhone 15 Pro Max. And it has more to do with work than anything else, but also the fact that, you know, iMessage and all the pressures that kind of come with being an iPhone user versus an Android user. But either way, this video is going to focus on one, whether or not I actually went back to my iOS device at the end of the testing period. And two, some of the things I've learned, good and bad, some of the workarounds I've learned as well um, to kind of share with everybody. But before we get into the video, if you can like, subscribe, comment, any engagement whatsoever really helps the video to grow, helps the channel to grow. And for me, I would be eternally, eternally grateful for everything that you all do, everything that you all have done, and all the support that you continue to give. But without further ado, let's get into this review. Now, moving on to the build of the phone, the Galaxy S24 Ultra uh, is a premium phone through and through. And obviously that's why I throw the Ultra name in there. This is the highest offering that Samsung has from a uh, build and technology perspective. It has titanium in terms of the metal that it features and then Gorilla Glass armor on the front and back of the phone. At this point in time, I've dropped the phone on a tile floor and I have no nicks on the screen. I have no nicks on the glass, no cracks or anything like that. Um, I do have a couple nicks on the top and bottom of the phone from that drop, but either way, it, uh, it does hold up really, 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 really well. And I think for the money that you're paying, it's hard to say that you're getting your money's worth, but I do think that you're getting an ultra premium phone, no pun intended. Now, talking about Samsung's One UI specifically, um, there's a lot that they do to kind of make the OS very familiar. If you're an iPhone user switching over to a Samsung device, there's a lot of similarities in the way they behave and even the way that the icons are and things like that. And I think obviously is intentional so that people who are switching or considering switching doesn't feel like it's so foreign. Uh, when someone uses my Pixel devices, they look at it and they kind of get lost in terms of what you can and cannot do with Android. And you know, side note, there's not a whole lot you can't do with Android. But either way, I think what Samsung does is making their OS obviously as consistent as possible from one point update to the other point update. But also what it does is it kind of eases that transition for people. So um, for me, Samsung does a lot of great things in terms of their OS. Um, one thing specifically is the split screen. That's one of the things that I continue to forget about, but you can sp uh, split screen, top and bottom screen. At one point I had my browser open on the top and I had my YouTube video open on the bottom and you can do full screen YouTube on the bottom screen in that bottom half of the screen. And then my browser is obviously condensed, but I can still manage with what I'm actually viewing on the top screen. That's great for productivity and things like that. If you're watching a video and you need to take notes on your Google Keep app or whatever the case may be, you're gonna use that bottom screen or up top screen, whatever you wanna do and kind of take your notes that way. They also have that little slide, that sidebar where you can kind of like slide from right, right to left off the screen. And what that does is like a quick launch tab and all of your most common apps are gonna be on there. You can customize it the way you want, um, but also you can launch your split screen from there as well. If you're launching the split screen from the OS itself, if you have your browser open, like for instance, Chrome, if you do a two finger swipe up from the bottom, you're gonna activate your, two, your split screen top and bottom. But with all that screen real estate on the Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra and the horsepower of the Snapdragon, uh, Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 for Samsung, um, it's handling all those tasks very, very easily. Now, something new that Samsung has done this year uh, with the Galaxy S24 Ultra is the inclusion and infusion of AI, more specifically Galaxy AI, and then you have Gemini or Google's Gemini kind of sprinkled in through the OS. And it actually gives you an option to replace your Google Assistant with Gemini. I haven't done that quite yet, 
I want to stick with my Google Assistant just because, I mean, that's just what I've, I've been used to at this point. And there are some limitations to Gemini at this moment, but Gemini is improving every day and very quickly at that. But you see Gemini kind of infused in the Google Messages app. That's my messaging app of choice. Um, and you have the Gemini like icon that lets you kind of select it and compose a message, compose a reply, things like that. But overall, I haven't necessarily used a whole lot of the AI features and it's not that I'm opposed to it. I just don't have it kind of like integrated into my workflow. And so I do see myself eventually slowly integrating a lot of AI features and a lot of the AI help into my workflow. More recently, I'll give an example where I used ChatGBT to create an outline for a video I was thinking about. I wrote in the prompt what I was looking for, what I wanted, and it literally gave me a three point outline for the video. Um, and I thought it was very concise. It was a very competent um, outline for a video. I never followed through with it, but I, it gave me a lot of confidence that I'm like, okay, I can actually use AI more so as a companion, as an assistant, as something to bounce ideas off of and get ideas from. So I think that's what we're seeing a lot of today, but AI specifically from OpenAI and Google is improving incredibly fast. Um, and eventually we're gonna have Apple Intelligence, which, which is and should continue to kind of push the, you know, the world of AI forward make it more powerful, make it more useful in our everyday lives. Now, a couple other niceties that Samsung introduced with the Galaxy S24 Ultra is the idea of circle to search. And it's something that they introduced on the Galaxy S24 Ultra, but also uh, brought it over to the Pixel OS as well. But it is exactly what it sounds like. If you see an item, you can actually just kind of circle it and you would get search results on the web basically. So on the Galaxy S24 Ultra, you would just kind of hold the multitasking bar at the very bottom and you would hold it, it brings up the prompt and you can either circle with your finger or with the S Pen. We'll get into the S Pen a little bit later, but you can circle with either or and it will give you search results. And so for me, it came in useful a couple times. One specific time I'm scrolling through Instagram and I saw a pair of sneakers that I just couldn't remember what the name of those shoes were and the handle, the, the profile of the page didn't actually name the shoe itself. So I took a screenshot, circled it, and it brought the search results up on Chrome and gave me purchasing results as well. So obviously this is gonna kind of be an, uh, a, a driver for shopping and things like that, potentially down the line as this kind of gets more robust. Now, there was another instance where there was a plant that I saw on the side of the road very bright, very uh, vibrant plant that I saw, that my wife saw. Um, we liked it and I'm like, I really wanna know what that plant is. I took a picture, I circled it, and it brought up the plant name and I found it locally so that I could purchase it and actually plant it in our yard. We haven't done it yet, but it was just cool to be able to, you know, take a picture of something, circle the search, and I get the results almost instantly. Obviously this is very similar to Google's, uh, Google Lens, which, lets you take a picture of an item and it gives you the search results. But again, on an OS level, being able to do it just from the base OS without having to do anything extra like going into an app or anything like that, it's very convenient. And when it comes to pictures and video, um, today's smartphones, just about all manufacturers have cameras that capture excellent video and excellent, excellent pictures. Um, and it really comes down to a matter of preference, how you like your photo. Uh, for instance, I know for a fact that Samsung with their display specifically, and then pictures itself on the computational side, it does punch up the colors a little bit, makes it a little bit more saturated, makes it more vibrant. That's something that a lot of normal consumers like, and that's something I actually like as well. Uh, whereas on the opposite side, the um, iPhone side, the pictures are as what people call more true to life, a little bit more muted, but more realistic, but it gives you the opportunity to edit the photo the way you want. And then they actually have picture profiles as well, where you can choose the specific look that you'd want for your photo. So again, it doesn't really matter to the manufacturer because they all really take excellent photos and excellent video. It really comes down to a preference of many manufacturer at this point. Um, and so for the Galaxy S24 Ultra, they have lots of options in terms of lenses and sensor sizes and things like that. Going to the lenses specifically, you have a front lens that's a 10 megapixel sensor on the rear. You have a 200 megapixel main sensor. That's a wide angle lens and that's what your camera defaults to. You also have a 12 megapixel ultra wide, a 10 megapixel telephoto, and then a 50 megapixel uh, telephoto lens that actually does that space zoom that 
has like 100x zoom. It's incredible. And for someone like me, I have not the greatest eyes. So if there's something I need to see far away, like for instance, paying for a meter, um, something that is probably 50 yards away, I can zoom in incredibly close, get the numbers off of that meter and pay for my parking. So um, there's a lot of use cases for the lenses themselves, but rather than talk about how great the video is and how great the photo capture is, let me show you. Now, as you can see, I take a lot of photos and a lot of videos of my kids and a little bit of landscape photography, um, any events that I'm at, obviously the best camera is the one that you have with you. So I'm taking photos um, at any opportunity that I have, especially because I'm chasing around my twins and my five-year-old. Um, but basically a lot of what I do, my kids are my muse. Uh, but as you can see from the photos, the, the photos came out fantastic, the video was fantastic. And the other thing about the Galaxy S24 Ultra that I don't think any other manufacturer does today is it gives you the option for 8K video capture. Now that's not something I do or I have done just because I don't see the necessity in it. I, you know, I don't have any 8K displays. I don't really have a way to edit 8K video capture. And so I don't really have a workflow for it. And for that, I don't really have a need to capture in 8K. But as you can see again, um, 4K, full HD, and then the, photo the photos themselves, you have options to go up to all the way up to 200 megapixels. Um, photos are fantastic, video is fantastic. Overall, I don't think you'll be disappointed at all with the Galaxy S24 Ultra camera. Now the battery is something of a hit or miss subject for me. In the beginning, obviously, and I think this is just about with every phone, uh, it started off great where I'm making it to the end of the day at about 30%. Um, and that's with normal use. What I'm seeing nowadays is at the end of the day, I'm generally finishing the day at about 15, 10%. Sometimes I have to get it on a charger. Um, and I think that has more to do with ge uh, my geographic location more than anything else. Uh, in terms of my cell network, I'm a Verizon user. My cell service is pretty crappy at the places that I work. Uh, in terms of my job, I don't have very good cell service, so my phone is constantly searching for a signal. So I can't really fault the phone itself. It is a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, but I really can't fault the battery or the manufacturer. It's really just unfortunately uh, an issue with my, my cell phone carrier. Um, one of the other issues that I have, and it does actually have to do with the manufacturer and more so Android, Android Auto specifically, Android Auto has a tendency to just, just zap my battery and it is more concerned with the, the fact that Android Auto, one for wireless Android Auto, it starts up the maps by default. When it starts up maps, your location is constantly being uh, pinged and with that, your battery is kind of just draining. So there's a lot of times where Android Auto, wireless Android Auto is active and I'm just, I can see my battery, my, my battery draining. Now this is something that I've shared feedback with, with Google as a user, as a consumer, and I hope that they give you the option because it's not available today, as far as I can tell, to not default maps as an opening app. And what I do today is if I get in my car, I actually open up all the apps running in the background and I just close it out and I take it off the screen. This way it's not running in the background. The other option is obviously just to plug up my phone and keep it charging while I'm driving. Again, that's not something I wanna do because I don't wanna screw with the battery and kind of uh, degrade the battery quicker than it needs to. Um, but again, I think your mileage may vary and it really is contingent on those factors. Now, we briefly talked about the display earlier, more specifically the glass that covers the display and it's Corning's Gorilla Glass Armor. Now, the display itself has two really great things going for it. 
and one not so great thing. Let's, let's talk about the great things first. First and foremost, that anti-glare coating that not a whole lot of people talk about, but it is one of the most clutch features on this phone. Uh, whether you're reading a book, watching a video, scrolling social media, the anti-glare coating just makes for a better overall experience from a consumer or user standpoint. Um, going back to a non-anti-glare coating phone like a Pixel 9 Pro XL, it's like looking at a mirror. So the differences are incredibly noticeable. It's immediately noticeable. The other great thing is just the display itself. It's incredibly colorful, it's incredibly vibrant, it's incredibly smooth, it's very bright. It's paired with the Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 for Samsung, and it's a mouthful, but it's a processor uh, allegedly tailor-made for Samsung's devices, and obviously the Samsung One UI and device is tailor-made for this processor, um, especially with all those AI features built in. But you have a phone that just zips through all of its UI. There's not a time where I notice where it's struggling to keep up with the demand. Even when you're running multiple windows, never struggle with not one bit. I'm watching video, I'm doing some uh, processor intensive uh, things like running Canva in the background or things like that. Things that would traditionally tax the processor. Not one time did I notice there was any issue on that front. So again, the display, the anti-glare coating, incredibly fantastic. Now, the not so great thing is the display has a tendency to dim when the phone starts to heat up, and that's obviously to protect the internals of the phone, but from a user experience, it makes it very difficult to use this phone outdoors, especially as it begins to heat up. Um, if you're you know, under direct sunlight or if you're in a hot area, the phone's gonna heat up inevit inevitably. But again, it kind of negates the whole purpose of that anti-glare coating if you can't see the screen at all. So that's something that it's, I don't, want to, I don't want to consider it a nitpick. It is a legitimate issue that I had that I noticed a few times. Um, and I learned to work with it and kind of just understand the phone a little bit more, but that's something to keep in mind. But overall, the display on the Galaxy S24 Ultra was incredibly good. Now, I save some of the best things for last, the S Pen. I, it's one of those things where when it was first introduced on the Note, I thought it was silly, but now that I have one and I use it, it is actually, there's a lot of utility to it and I actually have a lot of fun with it. Um, whether it's writing a quick list, if I have a quick idea that I really don't have a t the time to type it out or do anything like that, pop the S Pen out and just write it down. Jot it down real quick and save it in my notes. And this way I have those ideas that just kind of randomly pop in my head that I, I don't want to forget. Um, in terms of its usefulness, I, I know there's a lot of people that use it as a camera shutter and things like that. For me, I haven't used it that way. I've used it mostly for, in, you know, for instance, uh, Canva, you can make edits on there, um, be a little bit more precise in the touch points, like you know, dragging or cropping a photo. You can use the S Pen to kind of grab those corners and just make editing more easy. Um, but overall, the S Pen, there's a lot of utility to it. I found a lot of useful things and my kids got a kick out of it. I let my son kind of um, draw on a photo of himself and he was just coloring it. So it's uh, one of those things that Again, incredibly useful, something that I thought was a gimmick before, but obviously Samsung has kept it around for a reason and now I understand that reason. Lastly, I wanna talk about the issues that I've had transitioning from iOS to Android. And obviously one of the biggest things is the peer pressure of iMessage. You know, the moment that your bubbles go from blue to green, people lose their collective minds and it is what it is. Either you succumb to the pressure and you stay with iOS or you kind of just say it is what it is and you move on to Android. But you know, unfortunately, Apple begrudgingly included RCS this year in their iOS 18 update. What that means for users of Android and users of iOS is that there is the ability to send one, encrypted messages that make your communications more secure, but also the ability to send high resolution photos and videos to one another. Um, I think for me, that's probably one of the biggest highlights and it makes switching much, much easier um, for users. So if you're thinking about going from iOS to Android, but you don't wanna leave that ecosystem because of blue bubbles or the fact that your videos are gonna be, you know, potato, the RCS uh, standard that's included in the iOS 18 update makes that transition a little bit easier for a lot of users, myself included. So chatting with my wife and things like that, we're able to send high resolution photos and videos of our kids 
uh, without any real compromise there. So that's been a really great transition or a really great addition to iOS this year. Another thing is the blue bubbles, uh, you know, when you have your chats. One thing I did with my chats was I started switching to my email address, my iCloud, so that the, those chats can be maintained with blue bubbles. It's a stupid extreme to go to, but I also don't want to rock the boat. So in my group chats, I just started responding with my iCloud email. And what that does is it allows that group chat to stay blue. And then if I go back to my MacBook, I can actually just see the chat, respond to messages and things like that. So it's been pretty convenient. Um, the other thing is Apple Watch. I am an Apple Watch user. Um, I have years, like nine years at this point of data, health data, activity rings and all that fun stuff. That's not something I want to leave behind. It's kind of like an RPG. With an RPG, what makes them so addic addictive is you invest in your character, you build your character, you grow your character, um, and you become attached to that character. For me, my watch, um, specifically the Apple Watch ecosystem and the idea of fitness and activity has been incredibly important for me and I don't want to lose that data. I do want another watch, but I really don't want to leave all that data behind. Um, maybe one day I'll make the switch, but for now I'm keeping my Apple Watch and I have it tethered to my iPhone because again, for work. Um, but for any other people who have an Apple Watch who are considering switching but don't want to, you can live with an Apple Watch, you won't get notifications technically, but again, it, that shouldn't be a reason that keeps you from switching to Android. Now, one last little tidbit in my switch from iOS to Android is the lack of FaceTime. At this point, obviously FaceTime is baked right into iOS and it, it is incredibly easy to kind of make video calls to one another, friends, family members, what have you. But on the Android side, there's no availability of that specific app. Um, you can have an iOS user send you a link to the FaceTime video call, but again, it's just very cumbersome, inconvenient. What I've done at this point is I will send a link to Google Meet. The person on the other side will grumble and kind of get upset about it, but eventually they'll sign in because just as ubiquitous as FaceTime video is on iOS, so is a Gmail account. Whether you are an iOS user or an Android user, most people have a Gmail account at this point, so they sign in with their Gmail account, Google account, whatever, and at that point, you can video chat just as easily as anything else. And for me, it's integrated right into the messages app and into the phone app and things like that. So it's incredibly convenient if someone were to download Google Meet and that's a cross platform app. And uh, that's something that I can give some advice on is making sure that if you are someone who frequently switches between OSs or you're someone who's considering a switch from iOS to Android is finding apps that are cross platform. So for instance, on iOS, there's no notes app on the Android ecosystem, but there is a Google Keep app on both OSs. So I have downloaded Google Keep on my iPhone. I kind of migrated all of my notes and all my information from the notes app to Google Keep and that's cross platform. It's available on both OSs. So make sure that if you're again, switching from one OS to the other, you have cross platform apps that makes that transition much, much easier. So the big question is, did I switch back to my iPhone after all this time? And the quick answer is no. Honestly, I've thoroughly enjoyed my time with my Galaxy S24 Ultra. I love this phone so much. In fact, I have a Pixel 9 Pro XL that is waiting for me to start using and testing. And I find it difficult to leave this phone, um, which is surprising me because I was so against Samsung's One UI and it really has won me over because I made the phone my own. The camera has been fantastic, video has been fantastic, the build of the film, the design of the phone, the design is gorgeous. But I still have my iPhone for work purposes, but I've been tethering uh, using my hotspot on my Galaxy S24 Ultra to connect my phone to Wi-Fi. Uh, I still use my Apple Watch Ultra and soon I'll be switching to my Pixel 9 Pro Excel to begin that testing process, but I have a strong feeling that after my time's over with the Pixel 9 Pro XL, I will inevitably come back to my Galaxy S24 Ultra. But overall, this phone is an incredibly easy phone to recommend, albeit it's a, an incredibly expensive phone, but these Samsung devices go on sale all the time and they're offering ridiculous trade-in values for just about every device, especially, and obviously iPhone devices. So if you're considering this phone, but you're having kind of some doubts, um, I had doubts as well, but I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my time with the Galaxy S24 Ultra. If there's anything I missed or anything you would like to know about the Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra, please leave a comment. If you like this video, like it. If you didn't like it, dislike it. But if you really 
really liked it, please hit that subscribe button. Thank you all for watching and you have a great day. Thank you.